Now, there was a very famous physicist called Rutherford, and in 1911, he performed a very famous experiment. He borrowed some radium bromide, which was known to emit alpha rays. And the experiment he did was a very simple one. He took the radium bromide, he probably put it in some kind of lead-cased container, such that the alpha rays could be emitted in a particular direction. And he had a detector that enabled him to detect how many alpha rays or alpha particles were being emitted. And then he put a very, very thin piece of gold foil in the path of the alpha rays. And again, he measured how many alpha rays were being detected. To his surprise, he found that there was no difference. The number detected when the gold leaf was in place was no different and no smaller than the number detected when the gold leaf was not in place. But two of his students by the name of Geiger and Marsden, Geiger, by the way, was the man who went on to invent the Geiger counter, Geiger and Marsden, they played around with this. They moved the detector. They swung it all the way round so that it was facing backwards for the path of the alpha particles. And what did they find? They found that they got a very small number of alpha particles rebounding into the detector. And it only worked if the gold leaf was there. If they took the gold leaf away, they got no reflection at all. Rutherford was astounded by that result. He said that it was the equivalent of firing a cannonball at a piece of tissue paper and have it come back at you. But what could it possibly mean? The old current bun model was no longer something that was viable. The argument was that the alpha particles were hitting the gold foil and thus hitting the atoms but for the most part were traveling right the way through those atoms without being stopped. But every now and again, the alpha particle would hit something solid in those atoms and be rebounded. But it happened so few times that whatever it was that was solid in the atom had to be very small compared to the overall size of the atom. And what was concluded was that the model of the atom needed to be revised, such that the atom would have a very, very small nucleus in the middle, and the electrons would somehow orbit that nucleus, rather like the Earth orbits the Sun. Thus, when the alpha particles come into the gold foil, overwhelmingly they will just pass straight through the atom, because most of an atom is made up of absolutely nothing at all. Only those alpha particles that strayed close enough to the nucleus to hit it would be rebounded and reflect into the detector. And Rutherford could work out what the size of the nucleus was compared with the size of the atom by knowing what proportion of the alpha particles were reflected. And he concluded that the nucleus would have a diameter approximately 10,000 times smaller than the diameter of the atom. And if we imagine that by expanding the atom to be the size of an average room, then a nucleus would be the size of a grain of sand in the middle of that room. The electrons would be whizzing round the walls, but everything else would be completely empty. And so we now have a model of an atom which consists of a nucleus, which is positively charged, and electrons, which are negatively charged, orbiting that nucleus. This means, of course, that all the mass of an atom is concentrated in the very small part of the nucleus, which means that the density of the nucleus must be very big indeed, given that most of the atom is completely empty. In fact, it turns out that if you were to pick up a teaspoonful of nuclear matter, pure nucleus, no atoms, it would weigh 500 million tons. It was soon discovered that the positively charged bit, the nucleus in the middle of the atom, was made out of protons. 
and that a neutral atom would have as many protons as electrons. In other words, it had as many positive charged particles as negatively charged particles. And it was the number of protons which determined what the element was. So if an atom had one proton, that would be hydrogen. If an atom had six protons, that would be carbon. If it had eight protons, that would be oxygen. If it had 26 protons, that would be iron. If it had 29 protons, copper. 79 protons, gold. 92 protons, uranium. It's the number of protons in the nucleus that determines what the element is. It was Chadwick in 1932 who discovered that there was another particle that can also occupy the nucleus, and that was called a neutron. But the neutron doesn't have any charge. The question is whether protons, neutrons and electrons are the smallest particles that there are. Are these now the indivisible building blocks that Democritus was thinking of all those years ago? In fact, we now know that electrons are indeed the smallest unit of the negatively charged particles. But protons and neutrons, we now know, are made up of things called quarks. And I have a separate video on particle physics. The question then is, what are quarks made out of? And nobody knows. But this model of the nucleus gives rise to two very important questions. The first question says, if the electron is orbiting the nucleus, rather like the Earth orbits the Sun, then you have a negatively charged electron orbiting a positively charged nucleus. And we know that that means that the electron is accelerating. It is experiencing a centripetal acceleration because it is constantly changing direction as it travels round in its orbit. But accelerating charges emit radiation. That's the way, for example, that radio waves are transmitted. It's how television waves, radio waves are transmitted. Electrons are accelerated up and down the transmitter and that produces radio waves to be emitted. But if the electron is radiating radio waves, then it is losing energy. And if it's losing energy, it has to spiral inwards. And that would mean that the electron would spiral into the nucleus. And when it hit the nucleus, the whole atom would annihilate. And it has been worked out that that would take place in 10 to the minus 14 seconds, which is one 100 million millionth of a second. So this theory says that if the electron is simply orbiting the nucleus, it will spiral in, the atom will disintegrate, and therefore atoms can't exist, and therefore you can't exist. The second problem we have is that the nucleus is supposed to contain protons. Now, it's fine for hydrogen because there's only one proton in the nucleus for hydrogen. But for all other elements, there are more than one proton in the nucleus, which is very tiny. But we know that like charges repel. So two or more positive charges should be pushing one another apart. And all nuclei, apart from the hydrogen nucleus, should self-destruct as they force one another apart. But that doesn't happen. Why is it? Those are two fundamental questions. The first question, why doesn't the electron spiral into the nucleus, is essentially the reason we have quantum mechanics. We have to find a way to explain why an electron doesn't go into the nucleus. The second problem, why don't nuclei above hydrogen simply self-destruct because they are made of positively charged particles that want to repel one another, is the reason we have nuclear physics. It is nuclear forces which bind the nucleus together and I have a video on that.